Welcome, we're very happy to have you here with us today for a new webinar in our ASQ Innovators webinar series. Today's webinar is showcasing how Metro United Way implements their community-wide screening initiative. I'm Amy Klaus, Marketing Manager for Brooks Publishing, and today we have Kimberly Broker from Metro United Way with me. Hi, Kimberly. Before we get started, I just have a few tips for listening to the webinar. Um, Kimberly, if you'll move forward just one slide. We recommend listeners close any applications. Oh, one more slide. That's our series slide. Um, if you close any applications that take up any bandwidth, you'll have a better viewing experience. Um, and if you have any audio problems, make sure your speaker is set to the audio or you're set to the speaker selection in the audio tab. And then you also can try reconnecting um, if you have any issues. You can go ahead and type any questions into the questions panel section of your webinar panel, and we'll take those questions at a Q&A at the end. You'll go one slide forward. There's a survey that'll appear at the end of the webinar. Um, we really like to have your feedback on the webinar, so it'll pop up at the very end, and there'll also be a link in the follow-up email tomorrow, so we encourage you to fill that out. You can win a free book, and then there will be a certificate that's provided for all listeners. Um, the certificate is in your handout panel if you're listening live, and if you're watching a recording, we'll give you the URL at the end of the webinar today, and you can download your certificate there. There also are slide handouts that are uploaded in the handout panel. There's also a URL in the chat box um, if you want to get those, those handouts. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter. Kimberly Broker is the Developmental Screening Manager at Metro United Way. Kimberly was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, but she left the area in 1997. She and her husband hopped up and down the East Coast for 10 years for his job and then returned home in 2007 with two children in tow. He joined Metro United Way in 2009 and has worked to support the community with the Ages and Sages Developmental Screening Hub ever since. So welcome, Kimberly. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Amy. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and again, my name is Kimberly Broker. I'm with Metro United Way. I am the developmental screening hub and have been here about 12 years all in this area. And I'm so excited today to show and tell you a little bit about our work in our community, um, our successes and our opportunities that we have with the developmental screening hub. At Metro United Way, we know educational experiences during the foundational years can help children live healthier, happier lives. And just to give you a little bit of a background on our community, uh, Metro United Way services three counties in Indiana and four in Kentucky. We have approximately 66,000 children under the age of five in our region. Um, and Kentucky has a lot of work to do in early childhood area. We rank third in poverty and first in child abuse, not anything we're proud of. Um, in Louisville, which is our main city, um, Louisville, Kentucky and Jefferson County, we rank fifth in the nation for concentrated poverty and we have 43% of our children who live at or below 200% of the poverty line. And that actually goes for state and city. Um, we know early childhood experiences is really what it takes um, prior to kindergarten to be ready for kindergarten and to be successful. But access to those early childhood systems is limited. Um, the home visitation programs are fantastic here, but they have a short enrollment period and only available to age two. Um, and that leaves children that from two to five that don't opt for preschool without any way to monitor their development. Our county, Jefferson County School District relinquished their Head Start program in 2019, which left three and four year olds without access to high quality childcare. And then COVID hit, which obviously left many more without access. Only about 50% of our students access early childhood care before kindergarten, and only about 50% of our children are actually showing up as ready. Um, child care centers, probably just like in your area, are struggling to survive prior to the pandemic, and uh, we've lost about 45% of our centers, and we're expected to lose an additional 15 from staffing issues, from regulations, um, from low reimbursement rates, and a lot of various other issues. In terms of risk factors um, for children, our county and, and state aren't doing very well there either. Um, we have 9.4% of our babies born at low, low birth weight. 11% born preterm in Jefferson County. Kentucky ranks third in the nation for babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. 10% of our pregnant moms um, are smoking during, during pregnancy and Kentucky has the fourth highest uh, teen birth rate in the country. So as you can see, there's a lot of work that can be done. And this is one of the reasons that we want to continue and move forward with our developmental screening program. 
We're going to talk about mobilizing the community and how we are fostering relationships and supporting families, how we're building co our community's capacity to use the ages and stages questionnaire, how we're connecting children to high quality early childhood experiences, um, our healthcare provider outreach, and our new data collection system. So I'd like to start with how we're fostering relationships and supporting families. We did an independent research project with a small cohort of folks, but um, we found that those who completed four or more ages and stages questionnaires over a time frame did have a higher likelihood to be ready for kindergarten based on the Bergant screening. So we know that the, more, the longer they stay in the system, the more questionnaires they do, the more, uh, more chances they have to be ready for kindergarten, which is the key. Um, Metro United Way's developmental screening hub really supports parents throughout the year, early years. We know programming alone can't change the developmental trajectory of a, of, of a child. Um, that's why we developed the screening hub to incorporate many more things into it. So the developmental screening hub is really a system that's designed to screen, support, and encourage families in their child's early education using the ages and stages questionnaire and other aspects as well. We educate families on the developmental milestones and we really guide families through that intervention process and walk them through that process to make sure that they connect. Um, we help break down any barriers they have to receiving services because we know that the barriers to receiving services are critical to break down to make sure that they can connect and be successful. We provide resources and community services that not only uh, are for the child, but really encompass the whole family because we know if mom is, doesn't have everything that she needs, she can't provide her full attention to baby and the baby's needs as well. So it's available in our community to any child that's birthed to age five and a half that's residing in our set, one of our seven county regions and anyone can enter at any time in that age range. We actually can enroll children as early, prenatally um, and we don't send the questionnaire until five months. We get a little tickler that reminds us. And we have an emphasis on the zip codes that are identified as the highest needs. Um, as I said earlier, we do have a very high concentration of poverty in one area. So it's very easy for us to identify those areas and do a concentrated effort in those areas with the most needs. We also target children who do not attend organized care. We know that children who attend organized care have a readiness rate based on the Bergantz um, between 58 and 68% whereas children who do not attend organized care had a readiness rate somewhere around 30%. So that uh, shows us the need that we need to target those kids that aren't organ in organized care and potentially connect them to those services and that, um, those preschool and Head Start programs. So how the Developmental Screening Hub works is parents enroll their child in the Developmental Screening Hub a couple of different ways. We have a brochure that tells us all about the ages and stages questionnaire, what the developmental screening hub is, why it's important, and some frequently asked questions. And then this form on the right shows you all of the information and they can fill out all of the information um, to begin the process of completing an ages and stages questionnaire. It's a self mailer, so all they have to do is tear this off, seal it up and stick it in the mail. It's already uh, prepaid, so they don't have to worry about any of that. We also have a website that families can do, and you can see the website here. Um, you can go to metro90way.org backslash ASQ, and you can see the website has information, basically the same that's on the brochure, about what the developmental screening hub is, the developmental uh, screening is, what the ages and stages questionnaire is, and how the hub works. Um, they can click on this and fill out the form, they're basically the same form on the brochure, and it will take them directly to the ASQ online. If they're already enrolled, they can click on that and get to the ASQ online as well. So Amy, if you could put that uh, link in the, the chat, that would be great. I'll and go we ahead also and do that. Have, thank you. We also have a one-page flyer that also says um, what the developmental screening is. And this can be used at community events, baby showers, newborn packets, at libraries, at um, other social services agencies, and it has a QR code that they can scan and get directly to our website as well. So once they're enrolled, the parent will receive a link to complete the questionnaire online. Um, they can request a paper copy, but we are trying to push people to the ASQ online. Um, but we do realize there is a digital divide in our community. So we do provide all of the people that are in the targeted areas and the high needs areas with a paper copy. So once it's completed, we contact the parents. Um, if a parent shows a concern about their child, even if it's typical, even if the ASQ shows the child is typical, we contact that family and we talk to them about um, their questionnaire 
and why they have a concern. We talk about the milestones and when they can expect the appropriate milestones. For instance, a 10-month-old, um, they're worried that they're not talking in sentences yet. So we call and we reassure them they're doing all the right things, they're doing a great job, um, but you know, here's when you can expect those, those milestones. And then we can provide them with a developmental milestone list of when to expect the speech development. And then provide them with some information and some supports for speech so they have something they can do that's tangible. They feel like they are doing the right things and they're, they're moving forward. For those that have been identified as needing a little bit of encouragement from the ASQ, we'll contact those families and go over the questions, make sure that they understood the questions and interpreted them correctly. Maybe they've gained the skills, so we'll talk to them about that. And if they still need a little of encouragement, then we talk to them about what their options are, whether or not they want to practice at home, whether or not they need a referral, if they want to just wait and they feel like they're okay. We want to make sure that we leave that decision into their, their family's hands. Um, we believe that the family has the right to make the decision and that they know what's right for their child. All I have is a piece of paper, so they know what's right for their child. So we do encourage them to do the um, referral if necessary, but we know that it's their decision ultimately. Uh, but we'll also provide them with a letter um, and with the results. And if we have made a referral, it will list that referral in there. And we provide helpful tips on the specific areas that we're concerned. We, everyone receives a, the fun activities that come with the ASQ kit and we connect them to the right services in that letter. In addition, every family who completes a questionnaire, whether it's their first or their 10th, receives a free book as well. We have a unique thing in our community called United Communities. And what that is, is a seamless way to communicate with social services, um, such as health, the health sector, the education sector, the social services, and it's kind of a spider web of services. So when I make a referral for basic needs and um, a family is also working with a Friskies unit or a family resource unit with the school system, they can actually see that referral that has been made and also follow up with that family or provide some additional support for that area. The other thing that is really cool about United Communities is that it's a, a network and it takes a burden from the parent and from the family. So when we're talking and they need basic needs in terms of a food pantry, so I can make a, a blast of a referral to multiple food agencies all at the same time. And so once one accepts that referral, then the other ones are pulled back. And so that the referral agency is then responsible for contacting the family instead of the other way around. It takes the burden off the family and it's over, they don't have as much overwhelming um, situation to try to, to navigate that system. So um, the burden is released and it's, it's much easier for the family and um, they can contact the, the referral agency contacts the family directly. So it's a really neat program. If that referral does end up getting denied, I receive a notification and I can make additional referrals at that time. So it's a great system and it works really well for families in terms of not adding additional trauma and um, stress on the family. So another unique thing that we have is we actually continue with the questionnaires until the five, five and a half. So you can actually start at two months and do um, every other questionnaire until the child is five and a half. Because we know that 10 month old that was concerned about their speech may be great right now and looking typical, but by the time they get to two or three, they may have a speech delay. And if we're not monitoring them, they may not get uh, identified until they reach school. So we wanna make sure we connect with them. So they have the opportunity to continue in the, the program at, um, every three to six months if they'd like to. The other unique thing we do is we have a trained coordinator that actually connects with families between questionnaires to help break down any barriers or um, uncover any additional needed support. So the ones that are typical that didn't really have any concerns, we simply send a quick email that says, hey, I've been thinking about your family. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, you know, your next questionnaire is coming in March. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to call. And this really helps let them know there's somebody else out there that's looking out for them and um, that really is there to support their needs as well. For the ones that had any kind of concern, we do make phone calls directly to them and we talk to them about their, their concerns and see how they're going, see what progress they've made. If they didn't have a refer, they didn't take the referral, we might talk to them about the referral again. Or if they had barriers to that referral, um, we can help make that referral for them um, and see help break down those barriers. A lot of times when we call, we find that the family actually is in crisis and we can make those basic need referrals. So based on doing the ASQ, they can get all of these additional supports and um, have, have someone that they can turn to when they need, need support as well. So 
it's been really beneficial. Sometimes we'll have a baby that's born so we can enroll the new child. We've even had a couple of times where a family's house has burned down and they've needed basic needs. So it's really been very helpful to help not only build relationship, but retain them in the program as well. So other ways that we build relationships, we have happy birthday cards and emails that we send out. So the happy birthday cards, uh, we're actually revamping these right now, but they'll have the milestones for that specific age range. And we're working with an, our local Know the Signs Act Early folks who are designing this based on um, all of the CDC checklists. Um, so we're very excited with this partnership and are excited to have a new um, kind of fluffed up and refreshed look to them. We also send a happy birthday email to each child on their birthday. Um, so it's a great opportunity, again, just to begin building that relationship. We have a Facebook group as well, and we post different information, some fun information, some things they can do in the community. Um, like today, I posted this, the top 10 baby names, and you know, who's, got a, who's got a baby name on this list? And you know, it's a way to, for families to connect with each other and to learn different things that are going on in the community. I posted things like what toys are good for children by age, uh, things about tantrums and how to help their rational behavior, um, and just general stuff on, on different activities that you can do to enhance different domains of the ASQ. We also personalize our letters and ask about the concerns when we do send letters um, and emails. We always ask about siblings. Um, if there's a family that has had a child graduate from the program or that the, um, we know of there, there are siblings that they've mentioned them before, we always ask about them to know we're thinking about the whole family. And not, it's not just about doing the ASQ, but we're there to support the family. Um, we also make the referrals for the family. So if a family is having difficulties connecting with a service, we'll make that referral with their permission for Part B, Part C, mental health, whatever it is, and really walk them through the process. Tell them what they need, what they're going to expect from, um, when they're going to call, and then continually follow up with that referral to make sure that they did connect with them. And the last thing that we do, it's been really very helpful, is instead of just saying, here's your scores, this is what you need to do, goodbye, have a good day, we ask, what else can I help with? So that puts it in the family's hands of when um, the call ends. So a lot of times when I ask this question, I'll say, what else can I help with? Even if it's outside of their development, they'll pause and they'll say, you know, I'm having trouble with my utility bills. So we can then make those, um, those determinations and those referrals as well. So it's been very helpful to do that. We have a neighborhood outreach program as well. And this is another um, relationship builder. They do a lot of relationship building as well. Um, these are our feet on the ground folks. And in 2009, when we began, we started with a broad spectrum of marketing campaign. And we found that the folks in the, the highest needs neighborhoods weren't really participating like the ones that were not in the highest needs neighborhood. So um, what we did was a focus group and we worked with agencies that were already in the area to figure out why they did that. And what we found was it wasn't an educational issue. It wasn't that they didn't want the information. They were hungry for the information. But because of the traumas they had had in their life, they didn't want to be judged. They didn't want, um, they didn't trust us. They didn't know who we were or what we were doing with their information. So we began to build the trust. We began to educate families on who we were and what we were doing. Um, those folks that were already in the areas began working with those families. And we developed several videos uh, with people that were from the neighborhood that looked like them, that had some of the same experiences with. Um, and Amy's going to put those in the chat for you so you can take a look at them later. They're actually kind of long. So um, I want to make sure you have the option to see those. But so we began to educate folks on who what we were doing. And then we partnered with an organization called Play Cousins Collective. And Play Cousins Collective utilizes trusted neighborhood advocates. And what these are, are these for folks that live in those specific neighborhoods, that know their culture, know their, um, their resources, know their needs, and know the people that are there, the gatekeeper types. These are grandmotherly type trusted neighborhood advocates, um, and they literally build the bridge between Metro United Way and the neighborhood. So they introduce the ASQ to the families and explain what it is, and explain that it's, you know, it's a great thing, it's for you, it's for your family. It doesn't go to the school system. It doesn't go to CPS. That's, the, we're, that's not what we're about. We're there simply to help the families. So they build that trust and bridge, and they really engage the family in strength-based approach, utilizing strengthening family practices. They have an emphasis on social determinants of health and ancestral healing practices. 
and um, they really target five specific neighborhoods. They literally go door to door recruiting families. So they do what they call stops, where they'll walk a neighborhood and when they see a family out with kids, they'll approach them and invite them to their uh, programming. They'll knock on doors when they see a bike in the yard um, and invite those families to the programming. So it's a trusted advisor that's introducing something in a way that's appropriate for their culture. They literally stand at bus stops and talk to families with toddlers or preschoolers on their hip waiting for the elementary folks. They create playgroups and potlucks to help build that social network. They do parent cafes and social networks that are really designed to do, do um, to focus on what the parents need. So when they talk to the parents and they find out that they want to learn more about healthy eating, or if they want to learn more about developmental milestones, or financial stability, or whatever it is that they want at that moment, they'll begin to develop parent cafes that are around that and bring in experts on those, those community agencies and community um, events. They also do field trips um, to places that they may not have access to, like the zoo. We have a great park system here, so they take a, a field trip to Bernheim Forest. Um, they do the Science Center and the zoo and the art museum, places that they don't have necessarily access to and to help kind of level the playing field on um, high quality educational experiences. They do cultural events like Kwanzaa and Juneteenth and Fourth of July and Memorial Day and Easter egg hunts. So they're really building their community and their village. They do pop-up play dates. So they might show up at your local grocery store and have activities for kids right outside the grocery store. Um, they might show up at a daycare center and talk to the parents um, outside the daycare center with popcorn to you know, entice the kids to come, come visit and come play with and do their, their age appropriate activities. And then they're invited to their programming from there. Um, all of their programming, you have to be able to attend the programming, you actually have to have completed an ASQ within the last six months or be up to date on your ASQ um, program. So uh, they also support basic needs. They have a very small food pantry for families that are in crisis. They have things like socks and diapers and wipes um, and really ways just to basically support the family as well. And then most importantly, and one of the things that helps retain people in the program is every time they do a ages and stages questionnaire, they get a $10 gift card for their presence, their participation. Whether it's um, their first or their 10th, they can get a $10 gift card from um, the Play Cousins Collective to be able to participate. So they have lots of opportunities in, to engage and to uh, learn more about developmental milestones and the ages and stages questionnaires through Play Cousins Collective. Now, in terms of building capacity, um, building capacity to access and utilize ASQ is really critical to ensure every child enters kindergarten ready to thrive. And building capacity is, is not only making sure that the agencies have the ability, but also to make sure to use the ASQ, but also to make sure that the agencies have the ability to promote the ASQ as well. So um, one of the things we did was a landscape survey for the child care centers that were using the ages and stages questionnaire. And out of the ones that completed the landscape survey, only 70% were actually using the ASQ-3, 21% were actually using the SE, and 12% were using the ASQ-SE-2. So you can see that the SE was actually used a whole lot less frequently. And you know, one of the things that we know is, is essential for kindergarten readiness is social emotional development and only 16% were using the ASQ online. So we wanted to make sure we can build the community's capacity to continue to use the ASQ and to build the, the partner's ability to, um, to uh, administer that. So the main reason that people were not using it was the cost of the kits and lack of training. So what we did is we began to provide community trainings uh, from Brooks. We brought in a Brooks trainer and did trainings on a Saturday when it was in person on both the ASQ-3 and ASQ-SE and SE-2. And we began to distribute kits to the community through grants um, provided from us from the state and from other agencies, um, funders in the community. This year, we actually began to become a data hub as well. So we asked um, them to sign an MOA when they received a kit to share their data back, their de-identified data back to Metro United Way so we can get a better idea of how our community kids are doing and how we can shape policy. We held a best practice forum and we provided access to the ASQ online enterprise account to our Head Start program and to um, our uh, Volunteers of America. And we're gonna go ahead and use the ASQ hub account and bring on one of the libraries 
to you so they can screen their people that they have their relationship with um, on site. So we can also obtain their data de-identified as well and hope to bring on more partners. We partner with a home visitation and part C so that we, once they graduate from those programs, they are, have the opportunity to enroll their families into the developmental screening program. Um, and then we have, we provide technical support and we've developed training documents for the ASQ and ASQ online versions. We're working with the library story time folks um, and they have access to all of our brochures and our website and they're recruiting for families to uh, join the ASQ network. We've created a Facebook page that I talked about a moment ago. We're doing Facebook ads um, through a grant where we have um, folks that are producing Facebook ads and um, they educate the community on developmental screening, on uh, developmental milestones, and why early education is so important. We partner with KET for Bright by Text and their texting platform and promoted their program. We are partnering with the TAP program to ensure their families have access because we know they are at higher risk for developmental delays. We partnered with a hospital system where the social service folks are actually referring to families through their my charts, um, through their portals. Uh, they have, they're providing information to their families within their the, um, birthing classes and developmental milestone class. We're connecting families to early childhood systems. So when we find a family that is eligible for Head Start that is not in, that is not in Head Start, we'll provide them with an opportunity to enroll through our program. I actually can enroll them and get them started into the Head Start program um, by simply filling out the form through the Head Start portal. Um, we find that works much better and people do connect a whole lot easier that way. Um, we also provide everyone that's, that's potentially eligible to Head Start a flyer in both the ASQs that are going out and the results that are going out as well. Our campaign folks are actually talking about the ASQ to the people on the campaign trail and to the um, executives to help them learn about the importance of early education and what we are doing to help support that. For our pediatric outreach, uh, we began again with a best practices scan and we found that um, many pediatricians were not utilizing the, a developmental screener. They were, some of them were using PEDS, um, which is another screening type thing. Um, but it's not as, as um, intense as this, the ASQ. Um, and we found that a lot of them were simply doing surveillance. So we began to talk to providers about what they need. And we basically came up with three different, three main issues. They needed to know how to bill for developmental screening, how to screen during well child visits, and they needed a feedback loop. That was the big thing. So when a referral was made, they needed to know it was made and they needed to know what happened with that referral. They also wanted us to sign a business agreement and we got to this point with a pediatrician and then COVID hit. So obviously the pediatricians um, were um, very busy at that point, but we did know that we needed to be fully HIPAA compliant, not just our data system, but our whole organization needed to be HIPAA compliant. So during COVID, we began that process and that process was pretty in depth and detailed. It's taken us about a year and a half to get there, but we had to establish a compliance and security officer we had to create an organizational privacy and security policy, which is basically a manual of all of our policy that was an 80 page, very fun document to read, um, but it is a, a large document that was required to be HIPAA compliant. We had to implement security safeguards, both administrative, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning the ones, uh, the meaning we had to figure out who could touch what information. We had to do physical changes um, in terms of locks on file cabinets. We had to have shredders. Um, our technical side of it was our database had to be upgraded, our um, emails had to be secure, all of those kind of things had to be upgraded. So you can see there's a couple more things that I won't bore you with, but um, we had to go through all of these steps to be HIPAA compliant. So in the meantime, as we were doing the HIPAA compliance, we began to develop our, one of our pediatric champions developed this uh, screening testing code fact sheet that goes through all of the different opportunities to bill for developmental screening. Um, it's a 10 page document, it's very complicated. So we wanted to make sure every, and it's very different for each practice. So we then began developing a process map of how screening could look within the practice, whether or not it was a kiosk in their waiting room where they could sign up for the developmental screening through our program and then we would provide that feedback. Or if it was iPads that they would use in the waiting room to complete the ASQ. 
But one of the things that we found when we did the uh, billing information was to be able to bill for the ASQ, in some cases, the pediatrician actually had to be the one to present the scores to the family during a well check. And we found that most pediatricians were not willing to do that because of the time it took. So we were working with other opportunities to see how we could get them connected to the developmental screening hub. So we developed marketing materials um, and we have a marketing material that is the pediatrician would give to the family and the family would have more information about developmental screening. We also had one that we developed for pediatricians to introduce the ASQ hub to pediatricians so they had a little more information. We then worked on prescription pads so that uh, pediatricians could actually prescribe the ASQ to families. And the prescription pads, this was developed by um, the Help Me Grow Kentucky, and they were so grateful to share this with us. And the, they have different information on the back that says, you know, uh, discover your child's strengths and uh, read to them every day, talk to them. So it gives them some just some basic things that they can be doing at home. We also updated our permission forms and on our brochure on our website and ASQ online that basically says, if you give us your pediatrician's name, then we have, um, you have given us permission to share the ASQ results back to your pediatrician. So we have that information now and it's all updated and ready to go. And the last, oh, one more, we had um, developed a one page document that does the same thing for um, the people that are completing the ASQ online. I'm sorry, on paper. And so they can fill this out and check which ones that they give permission for us to share with. And this document actually also gives us permission and can potentially give us permission to share with uh, step parents or grandparents or anyone else that the family feels is um, necessary for us to communicate. So we had a lot of grandparents raising grandchildren in our high needs areas. So this is a, a way we can actually get parents permission to work with that grandparent if they're not legal guardians. Um, so then we developed the feedback form and the feedback form I would show you, but it's still in development. And uh, this is our last piece to develop for the pediatric outreach. So we're very excited to have that almost complete. But once that's complete, um, we can share that out too. Um, but it will basically let the pediatrician know when a referral is made and what's happened with that referral once we have followed back up. So we then updated our data collection system. Um, we were in an access database, which worked really well for a while, but is not HIPAA compliant. Um, and it's not cloud-based. So we did upgrade to an, a HIPAA compliant system, and then we could put the stamp on it that we were fully HIPAA compliant as an organization. So our system that I just talked about, the data collection and system tracking is called STAR, and it is out of Help Me Grow um, Alameda County, but we also partnered with Help Me Grow Kentucky. And STAR is a fully HIPAA compliant platform that is cloud-based, that is customizable and can create automatic tasks. So when I send out a ASQ, it will automatically remind me to follow up with on a certain time frame to ask them to return the questionnaire. It will, when I return a questionnaire, it will automatically remind me to uh, follow up on those results. It tracks um, the child's demographics and there's all kinds of different customizable things you can do in the system here. Um, the screening information, uh, it also tracks that, so you can enter your ASQ from paper directly into that, and you'll have all of the information in one place, so you don't have to keep the ASQ paper copies. Um, it provides information on the referrals and the outcomes of those referrals. It collects the information on the gaps and barriers to the referrals. And it provides care coordinators with a daily task list of things that are either overdue or due in the next couple of days or due today. So it, all, it always tells me what I need to be doing, which is really nice. Um, it interfaces with the ASQ online. So when an ASQ is finalized online, it is um, automatically imported into the STAR system. So I don't have to do any data entry whatsoever other than adding some of the custom, customized um, um, fields from ASQ online. It has a robust reporting capabilities. Now they're not pretty, but you can actually import them into Excel and make them pretty. But this one shows the number of connected um, and the number of that are not connected, and the number of pending and the number of unknowns for a specific time frame. So you can do the entire life of your program, or you can do the last week, or the last month, or last year, and you can actually compare them to previous years as well. 
it shows you the number of ASQs or screenings that have completed both total uh, for both ASQ and ASQ SE or individually. It also shows by domain. So this has actually been very helpful. And you compare year, you can compare year by year. So if you look at this one, you can see on top is this year and on the orange is last year. And you can see there's been a significant increase in the number of children that had fine motor referrals. So, um, and this is based on the score. So you can see that we, we need to change some policies and procedures to address the fine motor skills in our community. So we can go ahead and put some policies in place um, and really can report back to our funders as to exactly what areas need assistance and need support. So that does that for all of the domains. And it's really great to look at if you're looking at in terms of a childcare center, this will also help you determine uh, what you need to do for your curriculum as well. Um, gaps and barriers, it tells you where the gaps and barriers are and why people aren't connecting. So it gives you um, all kinds of different issues. And there's templates for customizable letters as well. In terms of our impact, we have done uh, 77, over 7,700 children have been screened by the ASQ3. And we have had some folks that have actually screened in just the ASQ SE, but that number is not included in here. So uh, overall, if you look at both ASQ3 and the ASQ SE, it's over 30,000 screens from the last 12 years. We've done 13,000 books have been distributed to our community. 29 children have been screened in the highest needs zip codes. And 1,600 children have completed four or more. So we hope that all of these um, impacts have really made an impact on our community. And we're very excited to continue. Some of our next steps are to really try to partner with WIC and see how we can bring that partnership. We hope to begin moving into some of the um, migrant populations and some of the other languages. So we're very excited to see what comes in the future um, with our developmental screening hub. So, and let's see, did that go too far? Yep, great. <laughs> yeah. Great, there thank you, Kimberly. Um, it was really interesting to hear about all the ways that your organization is engaging families and working with um, other providers in the community. Um, we have already started to get a bunch of questions. That's great. So if you have, if you're listening and you have a question, go ahead and type that into the question box and we'll take those in just a few minutes. I just have a few closing slides um, before we get to the Q&A. So I wanted to make sure that all of our listeners knew about the ASQ website. Um, we have a whole wealth of free resources on the ASQ website, so you can register for free and access those at agesandstages.com. You'll go one slide forward. We have another survey reminder, just um, asking you to fill out the survey to share your feedback about today's webinar and any ideas for future webinars. And if you yourself would like to present one of these webinars about um, your screening program, we would love to have you let us know that during the survey. One more slide I think is our certificate. Yeah, this is our certificate. So for anyone who's watching the recording right now, um, you can go ahead and pause it and then jot down that URL and get your certificate for listening. Um, and for those of you who are listening live, um, there is a certificate you can download in the handout section. Um, and you'll also get a link to an e uh, cert the certificate in your follow-up email tomorrow. Okay, so I think now we'll take some questions. Kimberly, if you go one forward, I think, yep, yeah, there's Kimberly's contact information. So we had a question about funding and how how does your organization fund all of the efforts that you do, your screening initiative and all the outreach efforts? Our um, state has a council. It's called the early, um, it's called the community, community, I never get it all right. Um, JCCECC was Jefferson County um, Council on Early Childhood. And that provides a significant amount of funding. A lot of our funding um, for the HIPAA compliance came from a funder, a local funder here, a foundation. So 90% of our funding is through grants, and we are also supported through Metro United Way as well. Okay. Great. So um, we had a listener who was interested when you were talking about the um, your outreach to pediatrics. Um, she was interested in the coding document that you had mentioned. Um, I think about how you code screening. Is that a document that you're able to share? Or? Yeah, I believe I can share it, but I think it, the codes are very specific to each state. So I'd be happy okay. to share that. 
um, but I believe it is specific to the state and every every state's laws are a little bit different. Okay, thank you. And I know the, the American Academy of Pediatrics also has some coding resources um, that might be made applied in multiple states or Medicaid probably. So we have a listener asking whether families, do they ever mail back paper copies? Of the, of the questionnaires or is it all through the online system? We um, do have some that are mailed back. When we began to merge to um, transition to the ASQ online, we don't mail out the hard copies anymore unless they specifically ask for it. So um, we do have some that mail back, yes, but it's very few and far between. Our advocates actually go out and pick up the ASQs to again, build that relationship with the families and check in on the families. So they actually pick up the ASQs and bring them back to our office. Okay. Um, we have a listener who's asking about when families go to the website and enroll, does it take them to their ASQ right then, immediately after they enroll in the program? It does. When they hit that submit button and they fill out the form, um, it does take them directly to the ASQ online and they can complete it there. A lot of folks don't for whatever reason, but many do. Um, so it is, is an option for them. Okay, and a follow-up question to that. Um, through that process, do you ever get people who aren't in your local area? And if so, what do you, how do you handle that? Yes, we do. It isn't very often. We have the ASQ um, enrollment form on our website that says, um, you know, what, what state are you in? And if they select anything other than Kentucky or Indiana, um, then it tells them that they're outside of the service provider area and they are not allowed to move forward. Okay. They Sometimes they do go ahead and say they are Kentucky so they can get to the form and then they fill out everything and then we, when we enter it, we catch it. Um, and this, we email them and say, I'm sorry, you know, our licensing agreement only allows us to do our service area. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so... We have a question. Um, so the people who are filling out the questionnaires, is it, majority of the time, is it the family members that are doing it, or do the your the coordinators that go out into the community are they ever filling it out? Um, every now and then, the, the coordinator that goes out into the community will assist the family, but the family really should be the one that completes it. Um, we have to have parent permission. So generally speaking, it's a mom, dad, or guardian that is completing the questionnaire. Okay. But the, the coordinators could help them complete it if they, yeah, they with needed assistance. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a listener who's asking about your WIC, um, the, your WIC in Kentucky. So they're asking whether they serve immigrants who have a status that might not be a legal resident or citizen. I'm wondering if that's a barrier um, to reaching that group with ASQ, and do you try to like reach that group outside of WIC? Yes, we aren't partnered with WIC yet. So that is one, a partnership we're hoping to develop. Um, but one of the things we find in our community is we have a lot of Hispanics in our community, Latinx. Um, so we have been working with uh, some of the, the folks that are, are the uh, agencies that work directly with them. Um, and again, they have a, a large trust issue. So that's where we build capacity for our agencies to use the agents and stages. That's where we might provide them with kits uh, we might provide them with resources and support for the referrals that they need to be made or with supports to help with that development if they don't want to reach out to another government agency. So um, we work with the agencies instead of working with the family directly so that they, they have that trust issue. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So we have one of our listeners is asking about the training that the person who reviews the results and recommends referrals. Um, what sort of train, how many people do you have doing that? Or what sort of training do you provide um, for the staff that are reviewing the results? We have, our staff has attended the ASQ trainings. Um, I have attended the train the trainers and several of the basic ones as well. Um, I am the one that generally review, we have two people. We have a part-time staff and myself and they, we've all received the ASQ trainings. Um, but, um, Yes, so we've we've re we've received the trainings, uh, but you don't have to receive the Brooks trainings. There are other options 
and on getting trained, you can use the user manuals. There's other documents on that resource page that Amy mentioned um, to learn how to, to utilize it. But the training is very beneficial if you can find it. And there are our, um, training, our credit, our state credit folks, the ones that provide the credits and keep track of the credits, um, the higher education credits, usually have a list of people that can provide that training or have provided that training for credit in the past. So if you're looking for trainings, that's a good place to start. Um, you talked a little bit about when you were doing that outreach to families that you you have to had to educate families on who you are. And we have a listener asking for a little bit more information about like what, what did you tell them? How did you go about educating them? Well, we really utilized the people that were in the area um, and let them kind of talk about who we are and what we're doing and why it's important. Uh, I think that was the critical thing was to allow them to understand why it's important from people like them. Um, so we we did videos, we've done um, flyers, we've talked to people, we are at um, we are at you know, events and you know again the Play Cousins Collective really has been the, the key in terms of talking to families about the ASQ and say hey I see your kids you know doing this and, and even incentivizing it is another really key way of getting them to listen. You know you do this you'll learn about your child's strengths and you'll get a $10 gift card to the grocery store. So um, you know, just continuing to educate them on the importance of it, the um, ages and stages questionnaire and early childhood education and providing them with opportunities is the best way to do that. You know, and just being out there and, and finding an advocate that is in the program um, that has done it with their own child is another really great way to educate them. So word of mouth has been a great way to get that out there. Um, I think that was one of our top 10 sources was other people talking about it. Um, going to places like mom's groups and doing uh, presentations at those kind of things. Um, those are better than doing like the health fairs and stuff, but the places where kids are like the libraries and the science centers and being um, involved there is, is another way to educate families on what it is. And, and if you can get a person that's done it for a while, and knows what it is to be your your um, spokesperson. That will be a help a, a way to educate people. And posting on Facebook, we had one post on a mom's group um, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. that said, "Look, I got a free book. They told me my child needed speech therapy, and I was connected, and they're doing great now." And um, we ended up with like 40 requests that night. So, um, any if you can get somebody in social media, that's another way to do it. Great. Um, yeah. So we have a question. So um, earlier you said there were you had seventy seven hundred questionnaires or, or kids screened. Is that over the length of your program? How many, like approximately, do you receive annually? Uh, that actually varies year by year. Um, the last couple of years we haven't had a whole lot of outreach in terms of marketing um, because we were trying to you know get the the HIPAA compliance and then there was um, there was you know, that thing called COVID. Um, and we probably do about right now between five and 800 a year. When we were working with community partners and actually entering their systems too, we were doing up to 1800 a year. Um, okay. Um, do you have any childcare programs that are integrated into your enterprise system? We have all of our Head Start programs that are. All of your Head Start, okay. And let's see, then we have a listener who said that the STAR database seems like a really amazing tool. Um, is that available to other states and organizations? And um, they asked sort of about funding to cover the cost of that, of how you kind of do that. Um, it is expensive to implement, um, but it is well worth it in the long run. Um, and we got grants to cover that and we'll continue to get grants to cover the yearly fees. It is available. There are, I think, 13 different sites right now across the country. Most of them are Help Me Grow sites um, that are utilizing the STAR database. There's a couple of different databases out there that do the same thing. I know that the Help Me Grow Kentucky has one out of Utah that they use as well. Um, but they to be able to do it, do that many a year, you really need to have some sort of database system that helps you track who's due for what when. 
Um, originally, when I started, I think we had 77 completed questionnaires and um, we were doing it in an Excel spreadsheet. And we did that for about a year and a half, two years, and then, then moved to an access, um, a custom built access spreadsheet. And that's actually a whole lot cheaper, but it doesn't do and track everything that you would need to and it's not HIPAA compliant, so. Okay. Great. Um, I think, um, so we have a listener asking about billing for ASQ. Um, so when we were talking, about, or when Kimberly was talking about billing earlier, she was really talking about pediatrics. So physicians billing insurance companies and Medicaid, you don't actually bill families no. or no. insurance yourself. It is all free. And in fact, um, one of the stipulations in the licensing agreement is you can't charge for it. So, but they can bill back. The, they can bill back to Medicaid. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And thank you, Kimberly, for sharing all about um, your program and how, how you've set everything up and how you reach out to families. Well, thank you again for letting me share my information. And uh, please reach out to me if you have any additional questions. I'll be glad to answer anything. Great. Thank you, everyone. And you'll receive a link tomorrow in your email with a link to your certificate and to a recording of this webinar in case you want to rewatch or share it with any colleagues. Um, thank you again for joining us for this webinar. This, this is the last webinar in our 2021 webinar series, um, and we look forward to more webinars next year. So have a great day.